Hello students, welcome to lecture 32 of the online course on nanophotonics plus bionics and metamaterials. Today's lecture is on carpet clocking and transformation optics metamaterials. So here is the lecture outline, we will briefly discuss about carpet clocking, we will introduce this topic along with some theory and discuss some applications. And then we will look into the designing of transformation optics based metamaterials like how you can produce uh, artificial anisotropy in metamaterials using transformation optics. We will discuss some application specific design and how to realize those designs. So transformation optics we have seen that it can be used to design a cloak of invisibility. If you remember the previous lecture, we have seen that how one particular sphere can be completely hidden okay, uh, by routing the light rays around it. Okay. So here is an illustration of real life invisibility clock. There is a lady standing here, but then the you know tree at the back of the lady is also visible so this actually makes the lady invisible right so to put it forward the only way to achieve actual transparency would be if the electromagnetic waves coming from the behind the object could somehow still arrive okay with the same trajectory in the front of the object as though the electromagnetic waves were transmitted directly through the object so that is the way you can achieve invisibility. So the object though it is there, if it is able to pass all the waves that is coming behind the object to the front of the object, okay, whatever manipulation you do around the object that is a different matter, okay, but then the rays will look like as if there is no uh, you know, object present. So this is how you can do. Uh, realize uh, invisibility. In essence, the cloak makes it, its contents appear to be very small and hence negligible. So, this is the way it has been you know, designed. So, here you can actually think of an object which is put inside a square shaped AMM target layer. AMM is uh, an isotropic metamaterial. So, this is another way of hiding an object by reshaping it. So, when you actually look into this object, it appears to be you know a square shape ones. So, how does it help in invisibility? Say you are looking for a circular shape uh, object, okay, but you are actually able to hide your circular shape object inside this uh, square shape uh, layer and then in the detection system the person who will be looking at this will say okay this is not my object that i am looking for because i am looking for a circular object and this is a square object so this also is a form of uh, invisibility you are making your circular object invisible to some extent right so this is a way of reshaping the scattering uh, cross section of the object or you can say radar cross section of the object. So, there are three distinct uh, topological possibilities for cloaking. The first one is the cloaked object can be crushed to a point or to a line and in the process of uh, crushing the object, okay, the object will become infinitely conducting. However, this is not a problem as the objects are of negligible size. Okay, so, for negligible size this is fine and it can be rendered invisible, but it will require extreme and singular values as well as being anisotropic. It means the requirement in this kind of cases would be something like you know you will have anisotropic permittivity and permeability and they may have singular values like 0 or infinity which is very difficult to or almost impossible to realize and the third possibility would be to you know crush the object to a sheet and in that case the sheet is highly visible and only way it can be made invisible if it sits on a conducting sheet 
so that this particular one is not distinguishable. Okay? So, you can understand that this is uh, more limited in its uh, application, but the invisibility here can be rendered without extreme values and with isotropic materials. So, this looks like a possibility to do it in real life because here you do not actually require those extreme values of permittivity and permeability and you can use uh, isotropic materials to realize this kind of a sheet. Okay? So, this kind of cloaking is called carpet cloaking. Okay? So, here a clock can help you mimic a flat ground plane. Okay? So, we understood that the carpet clock does not require singular values for the material parameters. Thus, the range of permittivity and permeability will be much smaller in the case of a complete clock. Okay? And you can see here that this is the object you are trying to hide. There is a ground plane and then you are trying to put a clock over this object so that you know it is indistinguishable from you know the overall thing is just like this virtual system okay so the signature from this object will not be coming out okay it will behave as if there is a just a plane ground plane okay nothing else so that is how you will be able to hide the object or conceal the object so here this shaded region as I discussed they reveal the ground planes and the observer will perceive the physical system as the virtual one with a flat ground plane because you have put the cloak on it. So, this cloak is called carpet cloak and this is doing the wonder. Okay? Now, let us consider the system as a 2D wave problem with electric E polarization. So, here you are able to see in the physical system this is the coordinate x and y okay? and in the virtual system okay, we are considering zeta and eta and this is the width and this is the height of the cloak okay, in the virtual system. Okay? So, a ground plane here is basically a highly refractive metal surface which can be regarded as a perfect conductor. Now, let us assume that this is the object we are going to hide and this is lying on the ground plane. Okay? So, you are basically covering it and once you cover it, it should behave like, you know, the overall thing should give you a feel as if it is just a flat ground plane. There is nothing on top of the ground plane. Okay? This is how you will be able to conceal the object that is shown in the figure. Now, let us assume that the cloak is basically a rectangular uh, size cloak which has got a width of w and height of height of h just that the bottom inner boundary is basically curved upwards like this to leave some space for the object okay and the whole configuration this particular configuration in a is called the physical system and it has got a coordinate of x y or you can say x1 x2 if you want to use the indexed notations on the other hand, if you look at B, that shows the virtual uh, configuration and this is what the you know observer should see. Okay? So, the coordinates there can be leveled as zeta and eta or you can simply say take zeta 1, zeta 2, okay? whatever notation you want to follow. Now, in general, we will now consider a coordinate uh, transformation which maps a rectangle, this particular rectangle okay, in the virtual system to an arbitrary region okay, like this in the physical system. So, we have to find out the Jacobian matrix that is A of i j that will be nothing but dou x i over dou zeta j okay. and here you can take zeta 1, zeta 2 or you can take zeta eta. It is better to go for uh, this zeta 1, zeta 2 notation. Okay. They are the basis vector of the virtual uh, coordinates which are appearing in the physical system. Okay. From that you can also obtain what is a um, covariant matrix that is given by G. Okay. G is nothing but 
this Jacobian matrix transpose multiplied by the Jacobian matrix that is A transpose A. Okay. So, what happens in this case? So, for cloaking the observer perceives the physical system as an isotropic homogeneous medium of permittivity epsilon ref that can be any value and mu ref is basically 1. So, this is the whole thing. Okay. So, here you are basically keeping your permittivity to be 1 and your uh, this one the permeability to be 1 and permittivity can be anything and that makes the system more realizable because you are able to change the values of uh, permittivity easily as compared to you know permeability in metamaterials also. So, the corresponding physical system induced by the coordinate transformation will be given by this. Okay? So, this uh, epsilon is basically epsilon ref over determinant square root determinant of the covariant matrix G and uh, you can also obtain what is the permeability mu i j that will be given by A A transpose over square root of determinant of G. With that you will be able to write down what is the transverse and longitudinal values of the permeability. Okay? So, these will be the principal values for the permeability tensor in the physical system. So, once we know this you can find out what is the refractive indices they will also be like N T and N L. Okay? So, T is the transverse one and uh, L is the longitudinal one okay? and you can find out it to be N T equals square root of mu L epsilon and N L is basically square root of mu T epsilon. Okay? So, these are for the two local plane waves that are traveling along the two principal axes. Okay? Now, to indicate the extent of anisotropy in the physical system, the anisotropy factor okay, that is alpha, okay, it can be defined as maximum of this ratio nt over nl or nl over nt. Okay? So, whichever is the maximum that defines alpha and that actually gives you the anisotropy ratio. So, we understood we have got all these things for our uh, carpet cloaking. We first got the Jacobian matrix, then we have the covariant matrix. We also find out the anisotropy factor and you can uh, prove that, um, that alpha plus 1 over alpha is basically trace of the covariant matrix divided by the determinant square root of the determinant of G. Trace is basically the summation of the diagonal elements of this matrix okay? and this is assumed that mu L and mu T will be 1. So, on the other hand an averaged refractive index N is defined relative to the uh, reference medium that can be defined as N equals square root of N L N T over epsilon ref. Okay? So, that can give you, you when you square it up you will get epsilon over epsilon ref and that is basically square root 1 over determinant of g. Okay? So, what we understood that instead of using epsilon and uh, mu i j for describing the physical medium, you can use uh, alpha and n which have got like geometrical meanings in term of the matrix. So, if there is a fine rectangular grid in the virtual domain with tiny cell walls which are of size say delta by delta. Each tiny uh, square can be transformed into a parallelogram in the physical system which will have two sides which is zeta 1 delta and zeta 2 delta. So, that way you will be able to map uh, this one. Okay? So, the virtual system will be able to uh, cater to the physical system which is like this. Okay? So, a small anisotropy will mean that a smaller value of this ratio okay, trace of g over square root of uh, determinant of g while a smaller area of the transformed cell. So, the cell area is basically square root of determinant g into delta square okay, and that will mean a larger refractive index n. Okay. So, in cloaking the compression of space in the physical domain essentially make 
the cloak anisotropic that we have seen in the previous lecture. However, here when you use this kind of transformation, the approach here is to minimize the induced anisotropy by choosing a suitable coordinate system. So, if the anisotropy is small enough, we can simply drop it and dropping anisotropy means you just make alpha equal 1 okay? and you can keep the refractive index n. In other words, you can say the physical system becomes just like a dielectric profile unit that is uh, described with just epsilon where you consider uh, permeability that is mu to be just 1. So, that makes life more simple. Okay? So, the dielectric profile will be like this n square equals epsilon over epsilon reference okay? and uh, that is given by square root of 1 by determinant of g. So, this way you are able to do it. So, this is the transformation. Okay? So, first from this is a proper uh, you can think of uh, rectangular grid. From that you have to go to this particular system and you have to see how you can now uh, define the grids. So, there are two types of grid system possible. One is called uh, transfinite grid. Okay? So, here the transfinite interpolation is basically used and the number of grids considered is 40 by 15 and as you can see the grid is just a linear compression along the y direction. Okay? And the other type of so, what, what happens here you can see from the color coding that uh, the permittivity value so uh, n square is basically epsilon okay? or you can say n square is uh, epsilon over epsilon ref that is same thing conveying the same meaning here. So, you can see that it has got low epsilon so that this medium is will be poorly approximated as isotropic okay? whereas you can use another type of uh, mapping and that map turns out to be the optimal one which is generated based on modified Leo functional. So, you can use this kind of a function to generate another mapping and that particular mapping is called quasi conformal mapping. Okay? So, what happens here in this particular uh, uh, grid all the grid lines are basically orthogonal. Okay? So, how it helps? The aspect ratio of each cell or you can say the anisotropy factor alpha becomes a constant okay? and the value will be um, around 1.042 while your n square is ranging from 0 0.68 to 1.96. Okay? So, anisotropy remains same in this case. Okay? So, here you can say that n or epsilon can remain uh, finite without approaching either 0 or infinity. So, you are able to avoid the extreme values. right? And this is the result of crushing the object to a plane instead of a line. And that is why no singular points are occurring in this kind of coordinate system. And here you can see are able to use high permittivity. So, this medium is well approximated as isotropic. Okay? So, this is the final um, test of this particular uh, carpet cloak. Okay? So, to test the effectiveness of the carpet design carpet cloak, okay, you can um, think of the cloak to be say 4 micron by 1.5 micron. So, these are the simulation results which are shown okay? and the cloak is defined relative to silica which has got a uh, reference epsilon. So, you can say epsilon reference is uh, 2.25 okay? and then uh, quasi conformal uh, grid are being um, applied and anisotropy can be um, avoided by only keeping the epsilon profile with unit permeability. Okay? So, mu is always kept as 1. So, in this case you can see the clock varies uh, the permittivity of the cloak varies from say 1.5 to 4.4 and uh, this range is pretty much uh, doable range because these values are close to 
you know which we can easily realize and uh, how how you can make you can actually take uh, dielectric substrate and drill sub wavelength holes of different sizes in say in the z direction of a, a silicon substrate and that can give you this kind of values of uh, permittivity according to the direction that you want so it actually makes it uh, possible to realize and outside the cloak okay so outside the cloak you can um, outside the cloak so this is the cloak region okay so as you can see this is the cloaking region this is the object okay and outside the cloak uh, it is again silica as the background material okay and you can assume that you know this um, inner surface of the cloak the the dent that you see here is basically coated by a highly reflective material so to the observer when you see so this is with the cloak so you can see the light is falling and simply it is reflecting as if it is a plain metallic surface okay but if you don't use the uh, cloak here that is this uh, dotted uh, black sorry the dashed black uh, rectangle that is basically the cloak so if you don't do that you will be able to see this different scattering and that will give the signature give out the presence of the object so this is how you can actually use it so using this kind of situation you can route light at your own will in the optical integrated circuits so here the electric field pattern is shown for gaussian beam that is launched at uh, 40 f degree uh, towards the ground plane okay uh, the width of the beam was considered to be 4 micron and the wavelength was 750 nanometer the background as i mentioned was silica and this is where the cloak is not present so you can see multiple reflection that actually tells you about the presence of the object okay so this is the clocked object it looks like as if it's a just a ground plane and this is the scattering from the object without the cloak here it reveals that there is something present okay so we can look into some interesting applications of carpet clocking the first one is reshaping the scattering of objects as i mentioned that uh, you can actually think of the object to be perceived so here it is a scattering from an ellipt elliptical object okay it looks like this okay and this shows the equivalent problem by an isotropic metamaterial layer which actually gives scattering from a rectangular object embedded in a anisotropic medium okay designed by transformational optics to scatter like an elliptical object so this is the actual reflection or you can say scattering happening from elliptical object and here you have actually put this uh, rectangular um, object in a anisotropic medium to give you the similar kind of uh, scattering features like an elliptical object so you are basically reshaping the objects the other one can be this one so another application is that here the electric field contours in finite element simulation shows reshaping of a square perfect electric conductor object into a dielectric object okay so here again so the dielectric object okay you have used a square pec object but that gives you the same uh, look or you can say the same scattering signature of a dielectric object so this is how you can actually reshape okay so now we understood that carpet cloaking though the application becomes limited but it is more realizable because you can think of uh, permeability to be always one so you can deal with all non magnetic materials and then the permittivity values are also very very realistic because you are able to avoid the extreme singular values like zero infinity very small or very large those things are very difficult to realize in real life so here you will see some you know methods of producing 
artificial anisotropy in metamaterials using transformation optics. Okay? So, we have discussed about sub wavelength gratings and we know that sub wavelength gratings are artificially made anisotropic media. The reason is this that when the electric field of the incident light is parallel to the slab, the grating slab, okay, they will have a different permittivity as compared to this one. Okay, here the electric field is basically uh, parallel to the grating vector. The grating vector will be this way. Okay, and this is the incident beam, and this is how the grating will be. Slab air, slab air. So it is basically parallel to the grating vector. So that will give you H mode or TM mode. TM mode. And when it is perpendicular to the grating vector, you can say it will give you the E mode or T mode. So when you see, you will find out that this particular mode has got a higher permittivity as compared to the H mode. Okay. So you can actually using this concept you can think of extending these structures so they can be either you know you take you know this kind of cylindrical rods and uh, place them in a you know square lattice or you can take a slab okay and then drill um, cylindrical holes in a square lattice so that will give you this particular case now, how do you say these are anisotropy? Because here you can see that when you take this particular material, okay, so along this axis, okay, it will actually uh, find this kind of a scenario where you have dielectric material and air, okay. Similarly, along this axis also here, it will find dielectric material and air interface. So, electric field will be basically. Uh, like this okay whereas um, in the third direction along the length of the cylinder or rods you will see that electric field is basically parallel here so that will give you high permittivity now if you think of the birefringence this will be called positive birefringence because this you can call as extraordinary permittivity and these are the ordinary ones so this is epsilon e minus epsilon o so delta epsilon here is basically positive and it has been seen that this gives you smaller delta e whereas if you drill holes you will actually get larger delta epsilon okay it's not e epsilon you can also think of negative birefringence that you can achieve by placing you know uh, sheets of different material uh, periodically so say you have uh, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 two different materials and they are they are alternating okay in that case along the material you have high permittivity along both x and y but this is a grating along the grating you will have low permittivity Okay, so this will now your extraordinary one. So epsilon e will be smaller than the ordinary permittivity, right? So why we bother about all this? Because when we discussed about you know the applications of transformation optics in the previous uh, lecture, we saw that we require you know this kind of uh, anisotropic materials, something like we will just take an example say you want to stretch this particular uh, coordinate system okay, and that will help you move the objects apart. Okay. But then the stretching in reality should be accomplished by replacing the right hand side this particular colored half with a new kind of material so that the rays actually remain in this particular slope so this was thoroughly discussed in the last lecture so i'll not go into the details of it again okay so here we have seen that this is basically the step one that actually tells us about generating the modified coordinate system so, and this is the calculation of the equivalent metamaterial properties that causes the rays to change slope in a desired way Second would be to define the modified coordinate system. 
So, suppose that the objective here is to stretch the x 3 this positive x 3 side okay, by a factor of s. So, in that case we have seen the you know transfer or modified coordinate system will be x 1 prime which is same as x 1 x 2 prime will be same as x 2, but x 3 prime will be same as x 3 over s. Okay? So, this is the how we have done also in the previous lecture. We have seen that the goal is to end in a standard uniform Cartesian coordinate system and the you know uh, stretching property should be now incorporated in the material. So, for this start with a stretched coordinate system like this okay, and then you think that the coordinate system must compress in space and that should help us obtain the equivalent permeability and equivalent permittivity of that particular stretched space something like this. So, this will be the new material which will have this equivalent permeability and permittivity. So, we have seen the calculation of Jacobian matrix. So, if this is the new coordinate system, you can find out uh, the Jacobian matrix and it is basically 1 0 0 0 1 0 and 0 0 1 over s. So, this is what we require and once we have the Jacobian matrix, you can calculate the perme permeability, the equivalent permeability using this formula that is A transpose mu naught A over determinant of A and doing this particular maths you can find out that it comes out to be S mu 0 0 0 S mu 0 0 0 mu over S. Okay. Similarly, the same same thing will also apply for the permittivity okay. and you can obtain the permittivity values to be this one. So, it is S epsilon 0 0 0 S epsilon 0 0 0 epsilon over s. So, with this particular values you have now able to get that kind of bending. Okay? So, that was the whole idea that you can stretch your actual coordinate system to space out two different materials or antennas in a particular chip and that particular uh, property of stretching of the axis can be now put into a new type of material. So, you do not need to physically change the length of the space, but you can change the material so that equivalently that particular stretching effect is taken into consideration. Now, mu e and epsilon e, these are the equivalent permeability and permittivity. And looking at the tensors, you can understand that the two elements are same and third one is different. So, these are basically uniaxial and when s is greater than uh, 1, okay, that is you are stretching it, okay, you can see that um, the third one will be smaller than the other two. So, extraordinary one will be smaller than the ordinary one. So, this we can name as negative uniaxial uh, crystal okay, or metamaterial. So, that is how n u m negative uniaxial metamaterial the term has come. Now, the again the question comes back to us that how do we actually realize negative uniaxial metamaterials. Now, for, permit, for perm, permittivity it is bit easy if you remember this particular cheat sheet that when you have uh, this is the slab and if you have electric field parallel to the uh, slab, okay, you will have high permittivity, but when you have uh, something normal to the surface of the dielectric material, it is low permittivity. Okay. Using this, you can actually think of designing negative uh, uniaxial metamaterial okay. and we have seen that new negative uniaxial metamaterial basically comprise of alternating layers of uh, dielectric so like epsilon 1 epsilon 2 repeated this is the period capital lambda and the fraction of one material is f so you can say the length of one layer is f lambda the other one will be 1 minus f lambda okay so this is the equivalent uh, material 
permittivity that you want to realize. So, you have epsilon O that is S epsilon and epsilon E the extraordinary one is basically epsilon over S. And from this you can also find out what is your S stretch factor that is basically square root of epsilon O over epsilon E. And epsilon is nothing but square root of ordinary epsilon and uh, extraordinary epsilon. Okay? Now, where this is important? coming back again that you can use this kind of uh, negative uh, uniaxial metamaterial to implement the stretching factor ok. Say you have uh, two antennas on a chip which are very closely spaced uh, but ideally you want that space to be say the distance to be say 10 times or 100 times more but you are not able to do that because of the limitation of the chip size. In that case, you can actually put a negative uh, uniaxial metamaterial that will implement this uh, stretching within that small uh, gap. So, equivalently, okay, you will be able to um, say physically the antennas will be located where they are, but then they will feel the waves will feel that as if they are far away from each other ok. So, this is what we are trying to achieve. So, s epsilon 0 0 0 f s epsilon 0 0 0 epsilon over s. So, you can see that it is high along 2 axis and small along uh, 1 axis ok and these are the parameters that you have already discussed. So, you can actually put this alternating layers of 2 material and that can give you this particular negative uniaxial metamaterial. Now, for negative uniaxial metamaterial, you can, if you have smaller contrast between epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, your effective values also will be small and here you can see extraordinary is always, the red one is extraordinary that is always smaller than the uh, epsilon naught. And this is the fill factor where you can get the maximum anisotropy. Okay? And if you consider larger contrast between epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, then you will be able to achieve higher, you know, delta mm, that thing also uh, anisotropy and at larger fill fraction. So, this f is basically the fill factor at which maximum anisotropy is achieved. And in both case, you can see this is negative uniaxials, that is why epsilon E is much smaller than your epsilon O. So, this is what we will be able to achieve if we use this. Now, what, uh, what we understood that epsilon O can go to the maximum value and epsilon E can actually get the minimum value. From this graph, you can understand okay, that the maximum value can be achieved by this one and the minimum value by the epsilon e okay and you can also find out the fill fraction okay so these are the limiting values that you can achieve using different fill factors okay so this is the relationship between the epsilon mean and epsilon max with the fill factor and epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 which are the permittivity of the two different layer material that you are using and you can also uh, get the maximum anisotropy strength using this formula that is basically your epsilon max minus epsilon min. So, with that you can op optimize and find out the value of the fill factor that will give you the maximum anisotropy and that turns out to be this and when you have that particular fill factor you can also find out what is that anisotropy that you are able to achieve. The same thing you can also repeat for positive uniaxial material. So, positive uniaxial material is basically array of blocks. They can be cylindrical or square cross section does not matter. So, these are basically rods or blocks you can say. Here again for this is for smaller dielectric constant between contrast between epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. So, here the effective values are also a bit low, but when you go for larger contrast, you can go up to very high values of uh, effective permittivity. And here you can see epsilon E is 
larger than epsilon o in all the cases because it is a positive uniaxial material. But how to realize? You can realize using this kind of structure and negative uniaxial you can realize using those uh, layered ah, this one layers of alternating layers of different or two different materials. Okay? Now, if you carry this forward, this anisotropy uh, material, the positive anisotropy material, there are different structures that you can think of. So, the gray one shows the material, the white one shows air. So, this is basically a cylindrical uh, rod you can think of and this is a cylindrical hole. This is a square hole, sorry, square rod, this is a square hole. Okay, So, this will repeat in square lattice. Whereas, you can similarly have this one, this is basically a cylindrical rod in hexagonal lattice, this is a hexagonal rod in hexagonal lattice, these are the inverse structures where you have white portion of the air, okay, air holes. So, why these different structures are seen, they, you have to understand that what kind of range of values you are able to uh, achieve using this kind of things. So, it has been found that hexagonal shaped rods are difficult to manufacture. So, uh, the circular ones are basically easy to manufacture okay? and they can give you um, higher anisotropy as well. So, and the rods as you see here in theory they, are, they can be like free standing, but when you fabricate this there have to be small connectors, okay? connectors between the rods to hold the structure together. Okay? So, you can actually think of a material for this kind of uh, structure okay? or the entire thing can be just made of polycarbonate which has got a permittivity of 2.57 and then you can think of optimizing the thickness of the support rod and what should be the radius of the dielectric rod so that you can get the highest anisotropy. Ah, so, you can see the thickness should be as low as possible and the radius should be around 0.4 r by a should be 0.4 that will give you the highest anisotropy of almost 0.2. These are the simulated values. So, I okay, will go to this one directly. So, you can also see that the uniaxial symmetry gives you the highest anisotropy and based on these results. So, these are the different parameters as you can see here, this is the radius of this cylindrical rod, this is the height of the rod, okay? this is the thickness T of the connector and this is the lattice period A. Okay? These are the different parameters which are being used and we have seen that the radius is around 42% um, of the lattice constant and that corresponds to this one. So, it is actually 0 0.42 where you have got, got maximum anisotropy. So, R by A, A is the lattice constant is 0 0.42. So, you can say the radius is 42 percent of the lattice constant. Okay? And you also see that the radius persists to be constant irrespective of the dielectric constant being used. Okay? And these are the fabricated ones. So, here you can see these are the cylindrical rods that you see okay? and these are the connectors. So, these are made in three different orientation. Okay? So, these are the parameters that have been used. A lattice period is 8 millimeter, radius is 6.4 millimeter, height is 13.86 millimeter and this is the thickness. Okay? And this is how it has been used. So, you, if you take uh, rods, in one case the rods are, these are the rods. Okay? You see the rods, cylindrical rods. So, the rods are in y direction, in z di y direction, sorry, first you have done in x direction, then in y and then in z, okay? three different cases and then using a VNA, you have measured the dielectric constant and you have seen that along two direction, they are similar and along the third direction, that is the z direction, you see it is different. So, it actually gives you that anisotropy. Okay? So, it actually shows that using this kind of concept, you are able to make metamaterials which are uniaxial metamaterials. Okay? So, this one was an example of positive uniaxial metamaterial, but for those stretching application will require negative uniaxial metamaterial, but this, this paper shows uh, fabricated result which has been published that is why from this group 
and that is why I am showing you the result of this positive uniaxial metamaterials and this should motivate you that yes this kind of structures can be realized and all these things that you have discussed in this course till now they are all achievable. So with that I will stop here and in the next lecture I will cover the introduction to alternative materials for all these different applications like plasmonics, transformation optics uh, and so on. So any queries you can drop an email to this address mentioning MOOC in the subject line. Thank you.